All right, so let's go ahead and kick off. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sharina Karani, and I am the Vice President of Business at Republic. Uh, SheWorks is focused on bridging the gap between female founders and funders and is working every day to bring a strong network of entrepreneurs who are shaping the future of tech and of investing. And so today, I am very, very, very excited to be joined by Vanessa Larco, whose career and passions very certainly certainly aligned with the SheWorks mission. Uh, some background on Vanessa. Vanessa is a partner at NEA and is focused on enterprise and consumer tech investing. Before NEA, she led product management teams at Box. She's working on the next generation of productivity apps across web and mobile. And her passion for design and analytics really stems from her experience in gaming, which includes leading speech recognition experience teams at Xbox Connect and building a top grossing studio at Disney Social, followed by founding a kids gaming startup. She's led investments in Clio, Rocket Chat, Majuri, Evident ID, Greenlight Card, Feather, and Lily AI. And she's also a board observer at Robinhood, Willow Pump, and OmniSci. And just as a friendly reminder, the views expressed during this webinar are those held by the individual participants and not necessarily by their employers. Um, we will be using the Zoom Q&A function uh, to, you know, to share any questions you have. I know a lot of you already shared some of your questions during the registration, but please do feel free to ask away and I will do my best to incorporate them uh, into the conversation today. So Vanessa, thank you so much for joining us and let's jump right in. Thanks so, for having me. Yeah, of course. And you know what? So you've spent so much of your time, you know, working at consumer tech com companies from Box to Xbox Connect, and you've had this deep experience. So can you talk about your experience at the sort of your journey into consumer tech um, and, you know, what you've learned from your roles there and how your startup experience has now led you to your current seat as a partner? Yeah. Uh, so landing in consumer tech wasn't actually intentional. I graduated um, from Georgia Tech with a degree in computer science. I interned at Microsoft in the least glamorous team they had, which was the office updates team. We're the ones that would say, would you like to install your automatic updates and we'll reboot your computer? So everybody hated what we did. Um, but I had a lot of fun being a product manager. I had never really heard about the role when I was in school. So um, I, I loved it and I, I thought I'd want to be a product manager. And when I was graduating and I was looking at my opportunities, I actually thought I wanted to live in New York and work in sales. And then Microsoft basically came back and they were like, well, if you could pick one team to work on, where, where would you want to work? And this is around the time the iPhone came out and Surface, which was Microsoft's big table. Now it's a tablet, but before it was a big table. And it was like the first touch technology that was um, really novel at the time. It was like multi-user, multi-touch. And so I said, wow, I would love to work on the service team if you have a role. And they're like, well, we don't, too bad. I was like, okay, makes sense. And then they called me back a few weeks later and they're like, we have a role in product. Um, well, they call it program management uh, on Surface. So I landed on Surface um, and it was a consumer centric product and worked on that for a year. And then I got poached to go work on Xbox Connect uh, on speech recognition. And I'm, I'm not a hardcore gamer, my brother is. And so he was like, how in the world did you get a job at Xbox <laughs> when you don't even play Halo? Um, but I got to work on speech recognition and I got to work with game developers on building this new interface into their games. And that's when it all like opened up where I was like, consumer is just awesome. I get to see people using the product. And you really focus on making things easy to use and affordable. And it's a trade-off between the tech and usability and innovation and pricing. And um, that's kind of how it all started. Uh, I was there for until we launched, which felt like 20 years, but it was really about a, a little over a year and moved to the Bay Area to work on startups. My whole dream was like, I want to be working at a startup where everyone has the same title and like titles don't matter <laughs> coming from Microsoft where it was like such a big hierarchy. And um, so I worked at Playdom, which was a startup in social gaming and we got acquired by Disney within two weeks. So I ended up in a big corporation, <laughs> um, but they left us alone for a while, which is good. 
And I got a really good experience working at a scrappy place and then started my own scrappy gaming startup, which didn't work. Um, and at that point I was really burnt out of consumer. So for all of the glitz and glory, it's hard. It is so hard because you make, uh, with microtransaction models, you make like a few cents off of each person a day. <laughs> That's a lot of work. Um, so I decided I wanted to go into enterprise software where your customers pay you giant sums of money and they're agree to pay you for years at a time. And I was like, oh, that sounds like such, <laughs> such a nice break from like begging people to pay me 10 cents every day. So uh, joined Twilio and then I joined Box and then in a weird twist of fate, I ended up in venture. Um, but let's, let's, and- let's talk about that. Cause I think that that turn into venture capital was a little bit unexpected for you. So, you know, are there are there any things that you wish you would have known before pursuing a career in venture capital now that you have been at NEA for a couple of years? Well, first, I, I feel incredibly lucky because I didn't, I didn't exactly pursue a career in venture. I, I just fell into it. Um, the way it worked was I'd known one of the general partners here at NEA for a very long time. We just crisscrossed a bunch and um, I realized that he had an amazing bird's eye view of the whole ecosystem. And so every time I was, when I was leaving consumer and wanted to go into enterprise, I didn't know anything about enterprise companies and who was doing well and who was not. So I called him and I was like, hey, what are like the top 10 hottest enterprise companies, series B-ish, C, that I should apply to? And he was like, well, here's my list. I was like, great, thank you. This is so much more efficient than just like, randomly applying to (laughs) to different companies. And then he realized that I had a grounds eye view, like I was in the trenches of using all these tools and these products. So he would call me when he would see something emerging uh, in a space that I knew. And so it was just a very mutually beneficial relationship over almost a decade. And uh, when my three years at Box is coming up, he reached out and we grabbed lunch and he was like, I want to help you in your career. You know, (laughs) how can I help? What are you going to do next? And I was like, I don't know. That's a great question. And um, we talked about different roles that I should try. We talked about different companies and different stages. And over the course of nine months, we got to know each other. I got to know people at NEA. And what felt like to me out of the blue, they gave me an offer to join. Uh, I didn't think I was actually interviewing for a job. I thought, we were exploring where I would go next. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I kind of just fell into it. So I, you know, I don't have a ton of great advice on if you purposely want to go into venture, how to do it, because everyone I've talked to that's in this space has just such a weird story about how they ended up here too, um, that I actually have no idea how to purposely get in. Yeah, no, that, that's a great point. I mean, so let's talk about where you do have a lot of experience. So for example, in your work at Xbox on speech recognition, you know, which was way ahead of its time as we had talked about, right? A a decade. (laughs) (laughs) And so, you know, let's talk about that. So during the pandemic, for example, gaming has, has been surging, you know, to no one's surprise. And I know you have some thoughts on gaming as well, sort of as a trend. So what are some things that you know we should be paying attention to considering you have been in the trenches, you have been you know, deeply working in some of these consumer tech companies, what are some of the trends that you're seeing and that uh, we should be paying attention to? Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, I think gaming falls in and out of fashion with uh, investors, but it doesn't fall in and out of fashion with consumers. I think there's been amazing gaming companies that come about the new games that come out every year, uh, actually. And it's, um, it's almost like the movie industry. It's, it's hit based. So every year there's always like a few great movies. Some of them become classics, some of them don't. Um, and when it hits, it's most of the time wildly profitable. Um, and when it fails, it, it hurts a lot because it took a lot of time and a lot of money to build these games. Um, but gaming has been around, I mean, forever maybe not digital gaming, but like physical board games, any kind of games, they've been around forever. People look for ways to challenge themselves and interact with other people. And it's like the most social thing you can do. Um, That's when I was like, you know, social networking and focusing on social as a category. And I was like, gaming is like the root of what social 
means. It's almost like eating food. Eating food is pretty social too. Um, but I think investors fall in and out of love with it uh, as time goes on. I think new platforms, every time there's a new platform that emerges, people get really excited. So um, when people started playing a lot of uh, casual web-based games and Facebook emerged as a platform for casual gaming, that was exciting. It produced a lot of winners, made a lot of money. Um, that also flamed out gloriously. Um, and then mobile gaming really took off and that made a lot of awesome companies and very profitable games. Um, and that's saturated, but there's still always room, just like there's always room still on, on uh, web gaming and, and on console. We have new consoles coming out this year, new generation consoles, which is really exciting. Um, so I think for a lot of AAA studios, there'll be new ones, there'll be great games that come out. What I think would be exciting is um, cross-platform games, games that continue, games that um, have more than just competitive play and, and world building. So I think we haven't really explored what it looks like to go from your console to your mobile and back, or from your PC to your mobile to your console and back. Um, so I think that it, it might be too early still. We've been talking about this for like 10 years, but um, I think at some point, that that will actually be really important and interesting. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, and speaking of saturated and the types of different types of things that we've been seeing, uh, especially this year, um, definitely just want to address the elephant in the room because I know that a lot of things have been changing this year. And we actually have a question from Danny. You know, there's been a lot of instability, a lot of changes. Um, and, uh, you know, you've talked a little bit about how venture capital could potentially be addressing a really risky scenario at the moment. So how has this year sort of impacted how you're investing and how you're looking at the market currently? Yeah, it's gone in waves. Um, so I'd say the first, well, there was like a pre-wave. It was like the little like pre-shock, um, which is when we started seeing what's happening in China, we have companies uh, that we've invested in in China. So we got to see firsthand in early January what was going on. And we saw the shutdowns happening in February and uh, we have a medical investing team who are composed of doctors and surgeons and politicians and all of that. And they're, they're fantastic. And they were sounding the alarm and they were like, hey, by the way, like viruses don't respect borders. <laughs> Pandemics tend to be global. Uh, it's coming, right? And so uh, I, I'd call my family and friends in, towards the end of February. I'm like, guys, got to get masks. We got to like, get food, we might get locked down, like what's happening in China might happen to us. And it was, you'd see it playing out there. And so we're like, okay, portfolio companies, like let's start preparing. And everyone's like, what are you talking about? What are you, what are you even saying? And my friends were like, you crazy San Franciscans, like <laughs> you crazy liberals. Um, it was very, very frustrating. And so there was this period of like pure fear and like wanting to do things, but not exactly knowing what to do. And I think we we got paralyzed, I would say for like a week or two, where like I wasn't taking any meetings. I was like, we got to go to Costco. Um, and then when it was clear, like this is coming here and it's here already, um, our portfolio CEOs, and, you know, I think I, there's been enough folks still around from when the 2000.com burst happened and all the mistakes that people made then and all the lessons learned that are still actually very fresh in people's mind out here. And so one of the things that everyone talked about was people just reacted too late to the 2000 bubble. And so no one wanted to make that mistake twice. So I would say 100% of the entrepreneurs I work with immediately emergency board meeting, let's figure out all, like, all the different cases that we might hit. So if all your portfolio companies all have emergency board meetings all in the same week, you're not talking to new companies, right? Um, and there was a lot to figure out. There was a ton to figure out and a ton of modeling. And so um, NEA basically went into, well, let's, first of all, everyone work from home, our office shut down. So we're, we're not even taking meetings with new people. Uh, let's focus on our portfolio companies. Let's make sure they're capitalized properly. Let's make sure they have a good plan for this year. If they were planning on fundraising in the next few months, 
let's see like what we can do for them so that they don't have to go out and try to fundraise in this environment where no one's taking new meetings. So, and we saw all of our peers, all the other investors were doing the same thing. It was just like, focus on your, your portfolio and then, and then we'll figure it out from there. I would say that was probably um, March, April, May was like, we were in this lockdown mode. So I feel for entrepreneurs who were trying to reach us where we're like, no, <laughs> like, our hair's on fire. We're working on a lot of things at the same time. Um, and then we started like picking our head up in June where a lot of our portfolio companies felt like they were on solid footing. The new forecasting seemed to be pretty spot on. We were, had burn under control. So once we thought like, okay, they're settled, they're on a good path, they're going to be okay for 18 months. Then we were like, hmm, we need to deploy capital. We, we raised a lot of money in January. We still have to be in business. And so even though you were uncomfortable and you were scared personally for your family and scared for your friends and scared for your portfolio companies, you really pushed yourself to like, well, I, I still have my job to do. Like I still have to find great companies and I still have to deploy capital. How am I gonna get over this hump where like I feel uneasy about everything? Um, and I think it was important for us to recognize like it's okay to be scared. It's okay to feel uncomfortable um, and, and find a new way to do our job. So I'd say in June, we started thinking like, you know what feels not as scary? Talking to people you already know. So everyone starts reaching out to the port to companies outside the portfolio, but that we'd met either at the previous round or we'd been keeping in touch or companies that we'd always wish we would have invested in, but we didn't have a chance to. We start reaching out to that. So like it's their immediate network, people we know, companies we've already looked at their data and understand their business well. And I would say that consumed all of the summer into the fall. So like net, net new, we'd probably, I think we did one deal where we didn't know the founder ahead of time, but every, every other investment we made, we had known the team before. Um, and so it's kind of ironic because we're VCs, we're supposed to be like the risk takers, like, you know, uncertainty is our thing. <laughs> and we like live off of this, like all risk, all reward. And the truth is that no, uh, it takes a pandemic to shake you to your core to where you're like, I just want to feel safe <laughs> and talk to people I already know. And I don't want to be out there. Um, you know, and what that comes down to is that we're all just human, right? Like yeah. I think the pandemic was definitely an equalizer in that way where we were all just like, let's take care of our friends and family. And that's what yeah. ultimately matters first. So um, I, I do think in one sense, I feel like VCs are sometimes put on such a pedestal. And in one sense, it's, it's pretty humanizing, right? Like VCs are people too. And they're not just, you know, walking bags of money, but they also, of course, have their own lives to, to take care of. So um, no, I, I definitely empathize with that. And now it seems like, you know, there is this shift where you are starting to talk to new founders um, yeah. and you're probably getting inundated, right? Like you're probably getting a ton <laughs> of emails. So, so how does the founder stand out? So how does, how does someone new that, you know, hasn't been in your network before that's now just reaching out or just trying to establish relationship? Yeah. What, what does that look like now? Yeah. So what I'll say is the good news is um, everyone kind of tapped out everyone they'd met before the pandemic by like August, September. <laughs> So I would say in October, everyone's like, huh, I need to meet new people. <laughs> I need to figure out how to do this like Zoom get to know each other thing. Um, and you start actually just like looking through all the emails of all the introductions people have offered and all the founders starting to reach out to you. And in the world where you don't have these like serendipitous moments, right? I don't run into someone at dinner and they're like, meet my friend who started a company or you go to, you know, this event could have been in person and I would have met hundreds of or 57 great entrepreneurs. Um, and so those serendipitous moments don't happen anymore. And the only channel I have is email intro or LinkedIn. Um, so I would say my inbox has exploded. I can't manage LinkedIn. I'm getting messages on WhatsApp and I don't even know how these people found my <laughs> WhatsApp number. Um, and so, you know, we're all trying to figure out how do we organize ourselves to like figure out who to respond to. Because unfortunately, now that it's ballooned to this volume, you can't actually even respond to any everyone. I'd say before pandemic, I would try to respond to literally every email I'd get. Now it's just, I would just never finish. It's impossible. So how do you stand out? Um, well, in the world where every investor is getting bombarded through email and LinkedIn, um, 
you know, warm intros do go a long way if you can, but I would be very targeted about the investors you reach out to. So make sure it's an investor that has not invested in your competitor. Let's start there. Um, figure out uh, the investor who has uh, some level of familiarity with your product. If it's consumer, you know, if it's something for kids, like maybe a parent would be a good place to start. Maybe someone that's blogged about parenting, someone that's like interested in, in that type of stuff. Um, if you're in fintech, you know, you could look at investors that are active in fintech. Uh, and reach out to them, but I, I would be targeted. And then in your email, I would explain like why you chose that investor. Um, so it's like, you know, the, the stuff I respond to, it's like, Vanessa, I've seen you invested in X and Y. I think those two or three companies would be great customers of mine. So if you're in a B2B, the best thing you can do is be like, you know, one of my companies, Majuri, and like, I think they'd be a great customer for this like SaaS tool I built. And I think they would benefit because of X, Y, Z. And then immediately I'm like, well, great. I can go ask them if they would use this. And if they think it's great, I'm going to want to dig in. And so um, that takes a lot of time. You obviously can't email 500 investors with like a very custom, well-researched uh, intro. But uh, if you pick the right 10, 15, um, you should get some response. And if it's really well done, hopefully they'll, you'll get a meeting and get to pitch. But yeah, I would say like highly personalized, increase your odds by making sure that it's someone who has interest and could make the investment. Yeah, and we also talked about, um, make sure that they invest in the stage you're in. So I get people reaching out to me in pre-seed. Like, I don't know anything about pre-seed. I would be like, and they're like, well, I just want some advice. I'm like, don't take my advice for pre-seed. I am like not qualified. <laughs> That's a really good point. I mean, it, first of all, it seems like just to get investors' attention, I mean, the spray and pray approach isn't really working anymore. Um, and then even if you are just looking for advice, then making sure you're getting an investor who's familiar with your sector, who's familiar with your stage, and might have some sort of interest or otherwise, you know, background um, in being able to actually offer that right advice and potentially connect you to the right type of investor. So that, that's some really, really helpful advice uh, overall. So thank you, Vanessa, for that. Um, um, and we do have a couple of questions, you know, around what exactly it is that you're looking for, you know? So what, what do you look for in founders, in a deal, um, and potentially if that's changed at all uh, this past year? Well, um, the areas I'm interested in have changed. So in a world where uh, I'm bombarded with so many things, I um, have really decided to just focus on the things that I'm personally really interested in. Uh, there's been some great companies that come through the door, like cybersecurity company, um, and their growth rate is impressive. And the founders have this like long resume of working at incredible cybersecurity companies and like everything's perfect. And I'm sure someone's going to make a lot of money on that investment, but like, I'm just not super excited to spend the next 10 years of my life on a cybersecurity company. I don't have the background. It's going to take me like a month to figure out what you're talking about. Um, so in the past, I'd be like, wow, great founder great product, I'm going to dive in. Um, and I could never get excited enough to actually make the investment, but I would spend like a month on it. Now I'm like, I don't have a month. Uh, we're all juggling childcare and a million things at the same time. So now it's like, I'm going to focus on things I know pretty well and that I like, which is like product management tools, product design tools, um, working with the CFOs and all my companies while we were replanning for COVID really illustrated how poor, poorly tooled the finance team is. And I'm like, how do you guys not have software for this? How do you not have real-time data? How do you not know what's behind the cell in, a, in like your Excel sheet? And so I'm like, I need to find some finance tools so we can fix this problem. So it's, it's problems that I personally encounter that I really care about fixing. And so it starts with interest. And then it's, pr it's product, like are you, have you built something great? That's why I don't do pre-seed because I like need to play with the product. Um, so is the product great? Do people love the product? It, does it show up in your metrics with usage and retention and expansion? And then the founding team. Um, what did you work before? Uh, what, what makes you qualified to tackle this problem? Why do you have some unique insight that other people don't have? 
that will give you an edge to make your product really stand out. Um, and, uh, you know, founders, I would say like storytelling matters. It shouldn't, but it really does because with each fundraise, you have to tell a story and convince people to follow you. When you're trying to hire people that have never heard of you or your company, storytelling matters to inspire them to join you. So I'd say like storytelling matters in so many different areas that being a good storyteller gives you a huge leg up. Um, so storytelling experience. I also look up who you've hired uh, and where they came from. And um, if you hired like in a, a senior product designer who came from Airbnb, I'm like, wow, it's really hard to poach a senior product designer from Airbnb. You must be a good recruiter. Um, so I look to see like who you're filling your team out with and, and where you poached them from. And uh, if you have a great team, a great product in an interesting market, then it's something I, I, pretty, I run pretty hard at. I love that. And I think that's all incredibly helpful advice in terms of how founders should be thinking about, you know, presenting themselves, presenting their companies and really just making sure that that pitch is just tight. Um, but now let's, you know, hear some of the, the dirtier parts. So like, what are some mistakes you've heard, you know, that uh, time and time again, entrepreneurs make over and over, whether it's from the, you know, outbound, whether through the, the warm intro or cold outbound, whether it's in the pitch meeting itself, um, even all the way through the term sheet, what are some mistakes that you've seen um, that are just major red flags and have basically just killed the deal right then? Yeah. Um, not knowing how much you want to raise or why you want to raise that money from venture. I know it sounds really trivial, but like, you got to start there. There are some amazing companies and I'll ask the founder, I'm like, you're breaking even or you could break even to be profitable soon, why are you taking venture money? Like, why wouldn't you just grow this thing and bootstrap and own 100% of your company? And if there's no good answer to that, that's alarming. Um, I get that everyone is starting to think that like venture is the only path, but it isn't. There's so many other ways to finance your business. So you have to be really thoughtful about why you want to go uh, with venture funding. Because um, one, it's not easy to get venture funding. And two, once you've taken venture funding, it locks you into a path. It locks you into a path of like, we expect you to grow at a certain rate. And if you don't want to grow at that rate, then you're going to have a really pissed off board. And so like, you want to make sure that the expectations are aligned. Um, so you got to understand why do you want venture money? Uh, and then how much are you raising? Uh, I would say like 30% of the entrepreneurs I meet with are like, I don't know, I'm raising anywhere between two and eight. I'm like, what? What do you mean two and eight? That like two million and eight million, that's a huge difference. And we expect very different things out of a company that's raising $2 million than a company that's expecting to raise $8 million. So uh, you kind of have to pick a number. And the way you pick the number is one, it has to be correlated to how far you are. If you have no product, it's very hard to raise 8 million bucks. Some people do. Some people can raise a hundred million without having like anything to show for. That's not common. I hate when those stories get written about because it's not the norm. Um, but if you're just starting off and you have a prototype or you have a few things, like maybe you just raise 500 K so you can build the initial product. And then you build, you raise 2 million so that you can launch the product and acquire users and test things out. And then once you have users and you have data, then I think you've earned the right to, to raise a series A, which can be six to 8 million. And if there's a lot of demand, maybe it inches up to 10, but you've got to realize that there's milestones to the amount that you're raising. And the more risk, the less money that people want to put towards that risk. And then the more you prove out, then the less risky it gets. And then the more money you can attract. So there's like a supply demand and you've got to figure out where that curve is for your business. Um, and then when we ask like, what are you going to use the money for? And I would say like the biggest faux pas is saying marketing. I'm going to spend $8 million on Facebook ads. I'm like, that's scary. Um, so, or like my salary, it's like, wait, what? Um, that rarely happens, but I've had it happen once where I'm like, you want to pay yourself how much <laughs> can I work for you? Um, so, so you have to be very clear about how long that money is going to last, where you're going to put that money, what you're going to prove out with that money, because every, every fundraise or every round 
is to prove out something, to cross something off the list, to cross one of the risks off the list and say like, we are, we've accomplished that or we answered that question. Now we need money to answer the next question. And now we need money to answer the question after that. And so you just wanna be very clear about like, what are you gonna figure out? How long is it gonna take? And how are you gonna figure it out with this money? Yeah, and I really appreciate you sharing some of the mistakes that have been made because I think often when we hear about startups, you hear about the success stories, you hear about what's gone right, um, and it always just seems this thing that seems really unapproachable, just unachievable um, for a lot of founders. So I think it's actually really helpful to hear about the, the mistakes that startups make um, and how we can learn from those. And uh, Tao actually has a question for you in terms of some of your mistakes. Um, and she'd actually love to hear about about your worst investment and, and what you've learned from that? Oof, well, luckily I don't have a worst investment yet. <laughs> um, I don't know, yeah, I don't know if that's luckily or not luckily. Uh, I'm four years in, um, we haven't had to shut down any of the companies I've invested in. So that's exciting. It's also scary because I know that that's not a real track record and I don't know who's gonna be the one to fail. Um, I guess it's almost like children. <laughs> you kind of hope they know and then they all work out. Um, but I, I, I can't even figure out, and everyone that I talked to in the business, like it's the one you least expect. I'm like, oh my God, please don't tell me that. Um, so I, I'm lucky and very fortunate I haven't had to shut anything down. So, um, you know, the mistakes I've made are mostly companies I've passed on. Uh, so one of my, my biggest regret is Figma. Um, I met Dylan at the Series B I, I was a very, I'd been at NEA maybe a year. Um, he was raising a big round. He burned a lot of capital to get to where he was and didn't have a lot of revenue traction, but had incredible user traction and user love. And I thought the product was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And I'm like, I know there's something really magical, but I don't know how to explain it. And to, you know, lead a $30 million round, I need to be able to justify that to my partnership. And I don't know what to say other than this is a really cool product and an awesome founder. I'm like, that's not going to fly. Right. And I just, I wasn't experienced enough. I didn't know how to position this and like, okay, I know we typically look at these numbers for this type of round, but this company is different and we should look at a different set of numbers. And had I had more experience, I would have been able to figure out how to position it and and how to show that like it doesn't fit in a box but it has its own box and that box looks really awesome and so we didn't do the b and then we looked at them at the c and they just exploded <laughs> and now it's too late um but i'm a huge fan of the company i think they're going to do extraordinarily well and i still kick myself in the butt about that one yeah, I think that um, definitely past investment opportunities are some of the worst because you just see them exploding. Uh, there's really nothing you can do about it because they're often too big for you to be able to come in at that stage. Um, so I would love to hear a little bit more about investing at the stage that you do because I think a lot of the founders on the call are a little bit on the earlier side, but often don't really know what to expect when they're coming on to raise, you know, post-product, post-revenue, um, and they're actually looking to raise their series A and B rounds. And we often mostly really talk to pre-seed and seed investors. So can you share more about, you know, what exactly it means to be a series A and a series B investor and, and how that might differentiate from slightly earlier stages? Um, and if there are certain things that founders can yeah, I would say that there's no easy stage to invest at. Um, when I first started doing A's and B's, I was like, man, those late stage investors that come at the C and D, what an easy job. I mean, the company's already running, like what risk are you even taking? Um, and now that I've been in this business for a lot longer, I'm like, oh, that's a lot. Like those valuations are crazy. Like, <laughs> how do you go, like, how do you see a world where they go like multiples up from those valuations? So, um, and then they look at us and they're like, oh, series A investing is so easy. Just pick a cool product. And if it does well, you own a lot of the company. So I would say um, every stage has a lot of risk. It's just very different. I gravitate towards series A's and early series B's because it's a lot about the product and the team. And it's a lot less like investment banking spreadsheets, which is the later stage stuff. Um, 
in the seed pre-seed, uh, I, I don't feel comfortable as comfortable in because there's no product for me to like mess with. And there's no user data for me to like sift through to see if it's really delivering on the promise. So I feel most comfortable at the A and I feel like I can help companies at the A build out their teams, build out hypothesis, um, look at their different data and make, try to make sense of it. So I can really help from the A to B to C. After the C, I don't know how helpful I am. I try to be, but I think I'm most helpful at the early stages. So when you're, when you're going in for a series A, you know, I, I would say that um, a lot of investors will say, well, we want to see your revenue. We want to see your CAC, customer acquisition cost, to your LTV ratio. And there's all these metrics that people want to see. But um, I think that's a little lazy. What I would like to do, what I like to do is like, okay, well, let's start. What problem are you solving? And then how are you solving that problem? And like, that has to be crisp. Uh, you can't imagine how many times you're like, I built this amazing tech. Like, what problem does it solve? We solve 70 different problems. Like, okay, what problem are people using you to solve? <laughs> like, um, so it, it's gotta be really clear. Like I saw this problem or two problems or three problems, but like really one or two and we solve it this way. Great, why is this way better than the other ways to solve this problem? Cause I'm guessing this problem has existed for a while uh, or may exist for a while in the future. And then it's, you have to have a unique opinion about why you think you've built this thing that solves this problem in the best way possible. Then I want to say like, well, what are your users saying about this? So are they using the product in the way that I believe that they're getting this, that value out of it? Um, and you can look at that in metrics and retention. You can look to see cohort retention and expansion and usage and upsell. And there's a million different metrics, but what at the end of the day, I just want to know that people love the thing you've built. Um, so, you know, you can use dozens of different metrics to prove that, but that that's really what I want you to prove at this stage. Um, and then that, you know, I'd like to know that people are willing to pay you, but that's not necessarily a requirement, um, but it's good to just makes you sleep a little better at night when you're like, people will pay for this. Um, and then it's the team. It's really the team. Um, there's a bit of, like I mentioned, experience and storytelling and ins you gotta be inspired. You have to see a future that's really, I wouldn't say different, but you have to have like a North star, like a big vision for your company and where you'll end up someday, um, but be very realistic about where you are today and all the steps you wanna do in the near term. And then there's chemistry because like, we're gonna be working together for a very long time and we're gonna agree and disagree. And we just, there's just gotta be like a really good working relationship. And that I think has been the hardest thing to assess over Zoom. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. And that's also, you know, kind of talking about team in particular. And, you know, we are here with SheWorks. We have female founders in the audience. And so I think we would be remiss to not really talk about, you know, what it means to be a female founder raising capital and what it means to be a female founder on the investment side of things as well. Um, so let, let's start with sort of your personal experience, you know, as a female funder uh, on the venture capital side, if you've sort of experienced anything that, um, you know, you're seeing differently in the industry and whether that's positive, you know, you've, we've seen a lot more um, women enter the venture capital space and really sort of, you know, take a stand and start to, to become partners um, much more so than we were seeing even just five years ago. And so, you know, starting with your experience, how have you seen being a woman in venture capital sort of shift and, and evolve um, to where you are now? Yeah. Um, so I would say I joined I think there was, I, don't know, I know there was a generation of women in venture before uh, my cohort, which I think is like the 2016-ish cohort. There's a whole generation of women before that that I really think paved the way for us. So I think it was infinitely easier just to, to be in venture when I joined than it was before me. And so I, I do think that um, with each cohort of women that, that really trailblaze, it makes it easier for future generations. So I would say like, I came in and I was pretty fortunate. Um, everyone at NEA is incredibly nice and professional. Uh, the, you know, the board meetings I sat in, our entrepreneurs are very respectful. So I didn't encounter a ton of adversity. Every once in a while, you know, I'd go in, I'd be the most senior person in the room. Um, 
and the entrepreneur would just assume I was like the note taker or would ask me to get them water. <laughs> and um, obviously in those situations, like not a good founder investor match. Uh, but outside of that, I think I, I haven't really felt, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what it feels like to be a guy investor. So I don't have a lot to compare it to, but it, it hasn't been that strange. And I really, I've heard stories about what it's like to be venture, in venture as a woman and I just really think the generation before me that like ironed a lot of that stuff out. <laughs> um, and then as a, a founder uh, trying to raise money, I do think it's harder. Um, a few things like one, like I mentioned, my interests drive a lot of the things that I invest in. Um, I'm interested in things that are very different than my male colleagues. And like, that's normal. <laughs> um, like I'm right now really interested in menopause uh, because I will get there someday and the solutions don't look particularly exciting at the moment. So I'm like, man, we should really figure that out before I get there. My male colleagues on the other hand are like, menopause, what's wrong with like what we've got? It's like, oh, so like, you know, different interests. Um, so I think, uh, you know, fertility, I, I think there's actually a lot of men interested in fertility as well, but there's more female founders in the fertility space and there's more female investors investing in the fertility and birth control space. So I do think that having more diverse investors means that there's more diverse interests. So there's more ability to fundraise if you're in these other categories that may not have appealed to like your standard white male. Um, but I think that we've, we've come a long way since, since I've been exposed to the venture world. And so I think there's more people for you to reach out to that have, that can align with, with your interest or your company. Um, the other thing I think was a bit of a hurdle is that we do a lot of pattern matching uh, when you're investing in early stage and you don't have a lot of data to go off of. So it's not rare to hear someone see an entrepreneur come through who, who presents and says like, oh, that guy, they remind me of Aaron Levy. Or like, oh, that founder, he reminds me so much of like Greg Schott. Um, and so like you see someone, you're like, oh, they remind me of the CEO that took this company public and had a massive exit. Therefore we should fund this person or like, they're amazing. And it's a lot harder when a woman comes through because you're not gonna be like, oh, that woman really reminds me of Mark Benioff. Like <laughs> I've never heard that analogy made. Um, but with more women taking their companies public, now you can say like, oh, this founder reminds me a lot of Katrina Lake, the founder of Stitch Fix, or this founder reminds me a lot of the, the co-founder of Cloudfair, Michelle. Caitlin, or, you know, you can start saying like, wow, these women have had big exits and these other women are coming through and they remind me of them. So I'm more inclined to want to fund them. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, and I want to get back to the female founder bit, but I also just want to see, do you have any tools or frameworks that you use to try to avoid pattern matching or are there, are there any sort of situations that you can create, whether it's with the other partners at NEA or that you've seen in venture capital that you employ yourself, um, you know, to sort of get out of that pattern matching box? It's hard um, because so much of early stage investing is subjective. And so it's hard to separate out what are the unconscious biases that are harmful and what are the unconscious biases or like that gut feeling that actually has made you make the right call and we're really exploring that a ton and we're trying to tease that out and we're trying to rethink the language we use right or like that founder seems really aggressive versus like that founder just seems very persistent right <laughs> and so like if we just use words that can apply in a positive light to both genders and, and all types of backgrounds, then I think we start getting to a place where we're less biased on the wrong vectors. Um, also the types of questions we ask, so we're, we're much more conscious about like, make sure we ask more standard initial questions. Um, there has been research that women get more questions about, you know, how do you plan for the downside risk? Like how do you risk mitigate? And we asked the guys more questions about how do you capitalize on the upside? And so now we're like, both questions are valid. We should ask both to every, every founder that comes through the door. And so just being more aware of um, what are some of the things that uh, 
we need to apply more evenly and what are some of the small changes we need to make. But I, I do think it's a slow evolution because so much of this is like you're kind of going with your gut on some of these investments. And sometimes like, like Figma example, like I knew it in there. I just couldn't explain it well. Um, and sometimes, you know, you feel that way for maybe the wrong reasons, but you don't know. You don't know until you really start teasing it out. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think um, especially with sort of the space that you're working in where uh, you are still very much taking into account the team and their ability to execute. You're not just looking at the spreadsheets, um, but there is sort of this gut check that you need to make. I do think it's it's hard not to fall into the traps of pattern matching, but I'm incredibly impressed with, you know, the, the thoroughness and diligence that you and the team at NEA seem to be taking around, you know, asking the right types of questions, being mindful of the types of language that we're using and, you know, how that can impact investment decisions, I think is, is incredibly important. Um, and we've gotten a lot of questions around this from the SheWorks community. So I just wanted to ask, you know, in terms of the female funding landscape, the numbers are still pretty terrible, right? And so, you know, we we saw this wave a couple of years ago uh, with the Me Too movement and with a lot of different uh, issues sort of coming to light around how investment decisions in particular were being made. Um, but we haven't really seen a change in the numbers. There have been a lot of diversity commitments, a lot of things being done. And it seems like um, you and your team are really taking some strategies and actually deploying them you know, within your firm. But you know, any, I just want to get your, your hot take on why are the numbers just still not improving, even though everyone seems to be aware of the severe lack of funding for really half of the population. Yeah, I've um, spent a lot of time looking through this. You know after George Floyd's death, we started looking at not just gender, but race, backgrounds, even geographies that we're investing in. And it was very curious, like we've traditionally done actually better job than the industry in funding female founders. Haven't done that much better than average on funding founders of, of um, different race. And, um, and we've done, we've, feels like we've put a lot of focus on it for over a, oh, at least five years. And so we've hired more diverse team. Like, how is this not moving? There's no apparent like good answer. And that's frustrating because we all want that silver bullet, right? It was like, if we just hire more diverse investors, we'll just have more diverse <laughs> founders funded. Um, if we just had more technical founders, if we had more this, if we had more that, and like, if it was cheaper to start a company, if it was less risky to start a company. And it feels like it's probably a thousand different little things. And I don't know, we, we can't stop trying and we can't stop measuring even if it doesn't, it feels frustrating that it doesn't move. Sometimes it moves up and sometimes it comes down. And what we've looked at is that it, it has fluctuated a bit. It's a little frustrating right now because it's down on, on gender. Um, but I, I do think that being aware and measuring and not giving up is key. Um, but I don't have a good, I don't have a good answer. No, oh, and I mean, I think it's also uh, one of the burdens that we often put on women in the workplace to often solve those problems when it is a much more systemic uh, issue. So thank you for, for sharing your thoughts there. I know that if there was an easy answer, I feel like we would have all done it already. Uh, but it's something that we're all still trying to explore and, and figure out, you know, what, what, you know, how we can work together to, to make this um, a more inclusive space. So, you know, let's, Let's rewind a little bit, uh, go back to when, you know, Vanessa was an undergrad getting that internship at Microsoft. <laughs> um, we have some students that are in the audience as well, and they'd love your advice on, you know, for finding internships, especially while COVID is still impacting student life. And of course, it's been a long time since you were an undergrad. Um, but if you have any advice for maybe, you know, sharing your story and how you got your internship and how that might, um, some of those strategies might still work today, even with the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, I was very fortunate that Georgia Tech had a very robust uh, career center. And so I found my internship through going to the career fair and applying, and then also like being overly prepared for my interviews. Like I would stalk my interviewer. I'd try to find like all the information possible about them and the company and the team and, and all of that. Um, I think you can't be over-prepared for an interview and you could definitely be under-prepared. 
Um, yeah, with COVID, I can't imagine. I mean, I, my heart goes out to you all. It must be really difficult, especially trying to figure out what's the right match and how do you how do you feel about joining this company versus that company when you've only had a few Zooms? Um, so I don't know what the right answer is other than um, lean on your network, see if you can find alumni at companies, maybe they can submit your resume. Uh, if you don't go through your school, the next best thing to do is go through a current employee. Um, they get flagged for the recruiters uh, as a referral and the referrals, most companies have a policy where they'll like actually look at your resume and have to reply back if it's a referral. If it's not a referral, sometimes they don't even respond. So I would try to go in through a referral. Um, I would be also very, uh, like I mentioned with reaching out to investors, be very proactive about what roles you're applying for and why you're uniquely suited for that role. Um, a cover letter helps. It helps the recruiter at least funnel you to the right manager. Um, so again, it means you can't spray and pray because you won't have the time to write that many cover letters, I think. Um, but having a pitch as to like why I'm a great candidate for this role at this company and making that really crystal clear, I think goes a long way. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. And especially now, as you mentioned, you know, we're in this time where you're just getting inundated with emails and so many people reaching out um, that I think finding a way to really make it so that your unique perspective and the reason why you can personally stand out uh, is, is just such a great piece of advice, I think, both for raising capital, but also, you know, finding that next role that could be your, your entryway in. Um, and I know we have, you know, not too many minutes left and uh, there are a few more questions that folks had to answer. Um, um, but if you do have, for folks in the audience, if you do have any more questions, please do go ahead and put them into the chat and the, into the Q&A actually. Um, and Vanessa will try to get to them as soon as possible. But I have one sort of last question um, that I wanted to ask you, Vanessa. So, you know, what advice would you give founders who hope to secure a call with you to pitch? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, please be looking for a series A or B. Um, and, uh, you know, in the very quickly and succinctly, uh, what your company does, why it's the, will be the leader in the category, why the market's really big and can support a big outcome. Um, and yeah, I think if the interests align and your background's great and you have an awesome product that people are excited about, uh, I typically, that's something I want to take a first meeting with. Amazing. And thank you so much, Vanessa, for taking the time to join us here today. Um, and for everyone in the audience for joining us, I know that there's a lot going on right now. We just had a big election. There's a pandemic that's raging and, and seems to potentially be getting worse. But um, the need for innovation and the need for female entrepreneurs to continue to solve problems in the world around them and continue to fund problems that they're, they're seeing being solved in the world around them is just more important than ever. Um, and and I just really appreciate everyone taking the time to join us here today. We will be, you know, staying on for the next couple of minutes in case you want to put any other questions that you didn't get answered into the, the Q&A. Uh, but thank you again for your time, Vanessa, and for everyone for joining us today. Yeah, I'll spend the next few minutes going through and typing out the answers to the Q&A. Perfect. Thank you so much. It was great being here with you all. Pitched me. I like half the time I get so uncomfortable um, that I'm like, I please like, don't tell me anymore. Like, I, I don't want to know because I'm really involved with this company. That's your direct competitor. So if it's a company that's directly competitive with that partner, um, don't bother reaching out to that partner uh, and don't mask it. Don't like pretend like, well, we're not really competitive because once you get into the pitch, like it gets very uncomfortable. Um, then there's the firm. Uh, NEA doesn't typically invest in competing products unless like one investment was done like 10 years ago or it's, it's, it's way past history or whatever. Um, so the firm, you make sure you find the partner that wasn't involved in that. Um, the other thing I get is I invested in a uh, jewelry company called Majuri. And then everyone now that has a jewelry company wants to come pitch to me. Well, um, just like in your personal finances, you want to have a diverse portfolio. 
in venture, I want to have a diverse portfolio. So I made my bet in jewelry. Uh, I make one investment a year. I'm probably not going to have two investments within two years in that same category. Or if I invested in customer support software, I've already got one in customer support. I probably don't want another one in customer support. So then there's like the adjacent ones, right? Where they're not directly competitive, but they're in the same category. That's a little tricky because I love customer support. Um, I'd want to know more about what you're building, but um, it's just the threshold is so much higher for me because I'm like, oh, I already have one. I'm already in that category. I might want to wait three to five years to see how that pans out before I make another investment in that category. So um, I would just look for a partner who like, if I'm in sale, I've done sales tech and marketing tech, then maybe I'm like heavily considering customer support tech. So I would kind of think about it that way, where it's like an enterprise app layer investor who's invested in things around it, who would get the problem. Those would be the ones I would target versus ones that have invested in a competitor or invested in something already in that category. Where do you get your inspiration? Who are your top female role models? Uh, I get inspiration from a lot of places. My mom, one of them, immigrated to the U.S. Um, and a single mom of two kids and, and was a three-time Inc. 500 entrepreneur and built and sold companies. And she's just crazy. Um, I don't know how she does it all and has endless energy. So she's a great source of inspiration. You know, women in venture, uh, Karen Nortman, I think is one of the most amazing investors and humans and just always has time for junior people. When I came into venture, uh, what most people don't know is that <laughs> just because you're in venture doesn't mean you're like in the club. Uh, I was like, hi, I'm new. And they're like, what's your record? What have you invested in? You're nobody, get out. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Um, but when I, when I got into venture, Karen Nortman just extended her advice and spent time with me and treated me like I was going to be someone someday in venture. And so I, um, I think she's just one of the best humans. And so she's a great investor that, that inspires me. And then, um, a lot of junior people at the firm inspire me. Like they're so young and have, they're not jaded at all. And they see the world through such a lens of optimism that I'm constantly like, okay, give me your naivete. I need it. I'm too jaded. <laughs> I can't make an investment if I'm this grumpy. Um, so I, I try to pull inspiration from everyone, people that are more experienced and people that are less experienced. And from founders to operators, um, I think there's so much to learn from a lot of different people. And with that, we are at time. I love that we got a chance to end on that question. That was such an inspiring way to wrap up our, our beautiful conversation today. Um, and thank you so much again for taking your time, Vanessa, and, and sharing your thoughts and insights with everyone today. And for everyone in the audience for joining us, really appreciate you joining us on this Wednesday afternoon and look forward to the next conversation. Thank, thank you. you, everyone.